Today, I'm up close and personal with Patricia Fripp. She is amazing. Um, she is the Hall of Fame keynote speaker, the to me, I know there are a few, but the to me, uh, and an executive speech coach and online learning uh, expert. We are honored to have Patricia on the 18th of June. She has agreed to deliver an online event, how to make good presentations great. So make sure you make a note and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, she is considered to be a true American success story, even though she comes from Britain. How dare they take her away from us? <laughs> But she'll be back. She'll be back. Growing up in Wilborn, Dorset, she moved to America at age 20. So young. Um, Patricia was elected to the first, the very first female president of the National Speakers Association. And no wonder Kiplinger's personal finance magazine wrote that she is the sixth best way to invest in your success she is the sixth both. I wonder what, you must also be the fifth and the fourth and the third and the second, really. And they only could count up to six being personal finance. I, I don't know. But uh, if you learn uh, speaker uh, and presentation skills from Patricia Fripp, you will be, you'll, you'll be in the best position you could be. So, you're, you know, we're really honoured to actually have her here. So welcome, Patricia thrilled to be with you. <laughs> As you know, I just came back from England yesterday. Uh, so I am feeling, you know, you're wide awake at five in the morning. Good job we're not talking at five o'clock this evening, my time. By then I know I'll be fading. Well, then we'll be, we better be quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got at least 30 minutes of energy left. Oh, good. <laughs> So, Patricia, let me ask you, first of all, about your early life. What was the one thing that has you've taken with you and carried you forward into your later life? The thing that's created the biggest impact? When I was seven years old, I start I. I started feeling that, well, I don't know that I'm as smart as the other kids in my class. I'm certainly not as smart as my brother, who really is. I mean, he's considered by many a genius. But I received 100% attendance certificates for years. Never won anything else, but at least they knew I turned up. And I believe the influence of my parents who, of course, always worked hard. And I thought, you don't have to be the smartest person, but perhaps you have to get up earlier. You have to do a little more work. So definitely any success that I've had has not been from being brilliant or the smartest. It certainly has probably been by being the more disciplined and certainly working a little bit harder. <laughs> For example, I became a hairstyling apprentice at 15. And on a Tuesday evening, models would come in and they'd pay two shillings and the apprentices would practice on the hair. Well, all the other girls would do one or two. I'd always do five and said to my boss, hey, can I bring more models in on a Monday? And because he saw I was so interested, he gave me, you know, in these days they were old fashioned hairdryers to take home. And my dad built me like a little salon under the stairs. And on a Sunday, the neighbors would come in. I would practice on the hair and, of course, make some pocket money. So it would be that good work habits. Get up early, stay up late. And another another part was when I left home at, fit, at 18, I went to live on an island off France, Jersey. And I worked in the wet, I worked in this wonderful new chic salon with with guys from the West End of London who could do hairstyles I'd never even seen before. 
But that, Janice, they thought lunch hours were for eating lunch. And I knew lunch hours were for squeezing in three or four other people who couldn't come any other time. And one day my boss told me, Patricia, you actually create 30% more income for the salon than the other stylist. Now they were getting paid three times more basic salary than I was, which was fair. They were seasoned, they were more experienced. But again, I realized Janice, that perhaps the willingness to work hard and the tenacity to expand the hours that people normally work, uh, perhaps I could take that to my advantage. And you think, well, where can I exploit it? And obviously the colonies. So well, I that leads me into my second question then. Yes. Um, growing up in a small village, town, uh, Wilborn, Dorset, what motivated you at such a young age to go to America? Well, the reason I came back to England was to go to a funeral of a friend, Peter. And there were two people I was there especially interested to see. My best girlfriend for all these years uh, was Wendy, Wendy Wellstead, she was at the time. And then Warren, who... Uh, was a very handsome guy in our town. And he said, would you and Peter, uh, would you and Wendy like to go out, my friend Peter and I, on a blind date? We went out on a blind date. And, and so Peter and I have stayed friends since I was 16. Uh, Wendy married Warren and uh, they were married for 22 years. And she's had two really nice husbands since then. Anyway, I digress. It was this vibrant woman. Wendy was two years older than I was. She was sophisticated and glamorous. And she said, I'm, I've got a pen pal in America and I'm going to go see her. And I said, wait till I finish my apprenticeship and I'll come with you. And then we went on this blind date. And Wendy, my role model, my hero, married Warren. And so she was not going to America. So I went and to Jersey because young women who came in my salon told me about Jersey. And I went for a summer, stayed two and a half years. And Janice, none of the kids ever thought about, oh, when should we go home? It's where should we go next? Yeah. And they would go to Spain, but you didn't make any money. And I was used to making money by then. And so in the back of my mind was America. So I thought I'm going to America. Now, back in those days, you understand, you didn't meet a lot of English people who'd ever no. been to America. We only knew it by the movies. So everyone I'd ever talked to said, if you go to America, go to San Francisco. So I thought, OK, I'm going to San Francisco. I can't ever remember looking at a map and actually seeing where is it compared to everywhere else. But I turned up at 20, no job, nowhere to live, didn't know anyone checked into the YWCA and I knew everyone in America was rich and the streets were paved with movies. <laughs> and I have not been disappointed. Oh, that's oh, wonderful. That's wonderful. wonderful. Wonderful story. I've so, got, uh, I um, went to Kenya and yeah. I remember yeah. applying for a job in Botswana and I had no idea where it was. I only knew it was in Africa. So, you know, that's all <laughs> the same story, same different story. continent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. So how did you start on your speaking journey, Patricia? Uh, well, when I first arrived, I was working in the Mark Hopkins Hotel in the beauty salon. And what was great, because in America, I discovered that hairdressers just work 100 percent on commission. No guarantee, no sick pay, no vacation pay. And to me, that was a license to steal. Uh, my boss said to me one day, oh, go back to England, bring over 28 your friends. I'll become a multimillionaire. And I well, said, Charles, I've never seen anyone who works like me because, you know, I was making more money for the salon than the guys who were much more experienced than I was. It was the good work habits. And then after three years, I heard about an opening, what was then becoming you. Uh, this was 1969, was the men's hairstyling industry. 
And one of my friends was working in the salon and I managed to get my, find my way in. And the salon was actually bought by a man called Jay Sebring, who did all the Hollywood hairstylists. He was really the first and only really famous stylist for men. And with all the movie star connections, for example, Joanne Woodward, Warren Beatty, Paul Ooh. Newman, and Julie Christie, who was dating Warren Beatty at the time, came to our opening party. This hand has touched Paul Newman. <laughs> So remind me to touch it next time. Exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, Jay Sebring used to do, uh, we were doing some demonstrations in department stores that sold our product line. And to cut a long story short, I started traveling nationwide for a hair product company doing seminars. And I also sold uh, I sold the, the products to other salon holders. And the, so one of my friends said, you've got to take the Dale Carnegie course. So I took the Dale Carnegie sales course, then the public speaking course. And because I was traveling, doing really hairstyling demonstrations, but I realized the guy in the back can't see what you're doing. You've got to describe what you're doing so he thinks he can see it. And you, even if people come to a hairstyling show for three hours, you can't just talk about hair. I will give them techniques on how to sell more products, questions to ask to find out if someone's going to be a good employee. How do you promote your business? And the talking part was so popular that the company expanded it. So the first day would do hair cutting. The second day, it would be a management motivation seminar. And then all my clients who were executives in the financial district said, oh, well, you're speaking. Come talk to my Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, Lions Club, Le Breakfast Club. And I realized that people who heard me speak came in my salon. And this was the least expensive way to promote my business. Because although I was solidly booked, I needed to bring more customers in for my stylist. They were good. But this is another thing that surprised me, Janice. I had good stylists, but, you know, they used to go home after work. Well, to me, you don't go home after work. You go to Harpoon Louis, the local the local watering home when you flirt with the cute stockbrokers and giving me a business card. Now, as our friend Will would tell us, that's now networking. Well, of course, in those days, it was flirting with the cute stockbrokers and passing out your business card. But, but so speaking for local groups and then what I would do, I would have some sort of raffle and offer a free hairstyle at my salon. So we'd get someone from the group in. So we knew next week someone would say, oh, well, you went to Fripps. Let's see your haircut. What was it like? So you see, I used it to promote. And then people started saying, well, what would you charge that to say to my, what would you charge to say that to my group? Because I was talking about customer service and building your business and and I said $50. And then the next time someone asked, I said, $50 an hour in travel time. He paid, said, I'll give you $125. And outside of the hairstyling, which paid quite well at weekends, I had only earned $175 as a speaker. And I was a big attender of, of rallies and seminars with the guys I met in my Dale Carnegie class. We called ourselves the Future Millionaires Breakfast Club. And we went to every seminar we heard about. And at one of them, we heard about the National Speakers Association. And then a, a famous speaker who was in my area was kind enough to talk to me. And he said, Patricia, you must go to the National Speakers Association convention. And I'm a great believer, Janice, that if someone you admire and wish to emulate gives you advice, you don't Take say, it. what does it cost? You go. <laughs> yeah. So I turned up at my first NSA convention. I was 32 years old, two years into a 10-year lease on my salon. And I loved the hairstyling business. 
And two situations appeared. One, I got the, the vision. I thought this is perhaps a profession I could have next. Because remember, I started hairstyling at 15. When my lease was up, I would have spent 25 years behind a hairstyling chair. And I knew there would be some type of business. Uh, perhaps it was in the industry, but speaking, I thought, hmm, maybe. And my goal, and this is a very important point of our story. I realized it was possible, but it was a long-term goal. And the advice I give to everyone, don't catch the speaking bug and go home and quit your day job. You plan for it. And I would recommend no matter what PSA, NSA, or any other of our colleagues in other nations, use speaking to promote what you are now doing, whatever it is. And I have a lot of my, my clients, I tell them, tell your boss, look, you know I like speaking. And a part of my introduction shows that I'm a sales manager with our company. Is it okay if I take longer lunch hours and go speak for the community? It'll be a great promotion for our business. So get support to be doing that while you're developing your skills. So one, I saw the image. Two, I got discovered by a big time promoter who booked me to speak to 2000 people on the same program with a man called Dr. Robert Schuler, who was a very popular uh, speaker at the time and a couple of other great sales speakers. So that was a good first convention. As it turned out, I retired from hairstyling a year ahead of my goal when I became the first woman president of the National Speakers Association, which had not been my goal. It was just the executive director realized for our 10th anniversary, it was only appropriate that it's time to prove it's not just an old, old boys network that we should have women in our leadership, you know, beyond just the board and committees. And so I was the first woman president. Jeannie Robertson was the second woman president. Since then, we've had a lot. Well, I know that there is a, there's a strong relationship between us over here, the PSA. There are many PSAs around the world um, and the NSA, and we're affiliated to, to the NSA. But I'm, I'm interested to find out what were the, um, the key things in your speaking plan that led you to be elected as the first female president of NSA. So were there any milestones or key things no. that you did? No. No. It really wasn't. I would say in those days, and it's difficult for us to imagine now, but for example, Mike Frank, the person who discovered me, he not only put on these big rallies and spoke himself, he really was a speaker's bureau. He's still a speaker's bureau. And he would say to clients, would you consider a woman speaker? And a lot of people say no. And then it got to the point. So it took a few people to really promote. I remember speaking at one conference and they had 37 people on the dais because you don't have as many head tables these days, but you did in those days. And someone said to me, this is the 87th year of this group. Not only is this the first time we've had a woman speaker, it's the first time we've had a woman sit at the head table. So people don't realize that. And then after a few years, it was companies wanted to prove that they were they were modern thinking, even in male dominated industries. And so then it became we want a woman speaker. And then I think it got to the point now it's more the expertise and the credentials. So I don't think that is as much a consideration as it used to be. So it's just a matter of. In the early days, 
there were only really maybe five somewhat well-known women speakers who had some expertise, could were had good platform skills, were amusing, if not. So it was it was a slightly <coughs> excuse me a slightly different world. But it, as I say, it wasn't my goal. It was more uh, the executive director, Bill Johnson, and obviously the thought of the board that this is the time for a woman. I would not have thrown my hat in the ring, as it were, at the time. I guess I was just lucky. It's interesting. I, re I recently had a conversation with a few people, actually, and, you know, the PSA may shoot me down here, but... There are, I, I don't know about the US, but certainly here, speaker book, well, there's two things. Speaker bookers are looking for, not all, some are looking for female speakers. And I certainly know in booking people to speak at PSA Southeast, what Richard and I, who's my co-president, decided we wanted to have an equal amount of female and male key speakers. And we... It's, we don't have a big programs and we meet every other month. So there aren't that many speaking slots, but we really wanted to make sure it was balanced. We found it really difficult. It's not to say there are not a lot of good speakers or maybe even great speakers, but they're not as visible. It was easy to list the male speakers than it was the, the female speakers. And also a lot of the uh, uh, women speakers, not a lot, some will have subjects that are not fitting with our theme. So they might be kind of health practices, not necessarily business um, that are geared to business and growing your business and speaking better and speaking more, which is the PSA theme. So it was really difficult to actually find those, you know, enough women to balance out our program. Is that uh, so? You, although women may have come a long way in, on the speaker, I think that we've still got a long way to go to actually be a visible equality. I don't know what you think. I would think in the National Speakers Association, that is not an issue. Right. Uh, we have a lot of really dynamic women leaders, very visible in lots of different uh, situations in business. So uh, probably just because speaking has been around as a profession a lot longer in America. So I'd say it's just a matter of time. And what of do you think America is so here? big? Remember, little England fits. In I know, a I know, but you know, I'm, I'm for the girls, <laughs> Patricia. I'm for the girls. <laughs> what do you think we need to do as female speakers to make sure that we up our profile, we get out there, we're booked more? What do you think we need to do? I would give the same advice to women as I would for men, and this. Uh, naturally, I am interviewed a lot and a lot of people write and say, hey, can I, you know, I want to talk to you, pick your brain or something. And there is, is, all right, I'll answer one question. What is it? And if people say, how did you get started? I'd say that is the wrong question to be asking me. Because when I started, the industry was smaller. There was no technology. There weren't contact management systems. There weren't websites. There weren't blogs. There wasn't LinkedIn. The question you need to ask is, what advice would you give to somebody getting started now? And so this would be, so there are three there are three areas you need to focus on. One, you better have a damn good speech, a seminar, coaching program, whatever it is you are taking to the marketplace. It better be good. The quality of your information, the quality of your delivery has to be at a certain standard. Now, if you, let's say you're a best-selling author, which I'm not, <coughs> or a celebrity, which I'm not, then the quality of your delivering and content has to be better.
You know, there are people, if they are famous, we just want to hear from them, even if they don't deliver them the message as well as we might. Uh, if someone is a best-selling author that we love their content, if their platform skills aren't brilliant, they are forgiven because of who they are. If you are a non-celebrity creating a visibility for your content, you need to be a good speaker. Two, you need to be as good a marketer as you are a speaker. So this would be true, women, men, everybody. You have to have a certain visibility, which is now very inexpensive in comparison. You need a good website, even if it's small. Blog, use social media. At very least, I would say LinkedIn. Then, uh, Keep in touch, have a good contact management. I always say it's not your customer prospect's job to remember you. It's your obligation and responsibility to make sure they don't have the chance to forget you. So then you, the third is you have to understand the industry. And that's why people join PSA or NSA or whatever their association is in the country that they are or continent they are part of, understand how the business works because it is a business. People are talking, I want to get on the speaking circuit. What circuit? That is a phrase more than uh, an actual entity. There are people who are experts in industries many of us have not heard about. But they are, they are content experts in an area. So I personally, now over the years it's developed. So my expertise that I like to, and, and what my passion is, is to focus on presentation skills. It could be leadership presentations. It could be speakers. How do you design a keynote speech that people want to pay? It could be engineers, which I love a lot of engineers in my world. So it's a matter of how do you deliver your content at your customer conferences in a way that is compelling and interesting and connecting. So they are the three areas and it's true for everybody. Take advantage of what's available. How about YouTube? It's free. You can take your advice, your content, and put it on YouTube. So that's my advice. None of this was available when I got started. Well, uh, and I know that you absolutely um, uh, capitalize on it because you have a Frip VT dot com which is your membership site um so tell people what your members receive on that site all right good well what you have to do and this is the secret to being in this industry i am a 42 year old a 42 year member of the national speakers association and i say that not to impress you or to have you think oh my god how old is this woman because i pretty much told you when i first attended it's a matter of just, I have seen and heard and learned a lot in 42 years. And the key to longevity is to listen to your clients. It was listening to my clients when they, a national sales manager said, I liked your speech. However, can you teach our salespeople? You know, I like your speech, but I love the way you deliver it. Can you speech, teach our salespeople to speak that way? Because we're losing sales. It has nothing to do with our offering or our price. The presentation skills of our competitors are better. So it was listening to the marketplace that I discovered where I should put my energy and efforts. Well, it's the same. A lot of companies now, they say, Fred, we don't get everyone together in one place. You know, we want to train them so at least some of it can be self-study. And so you listen to the market 
And if anybody, whether it's just an individual, oh, I'd like to know what Patricia Fripp has spent well over 30 years and big bucks learning in an easy, convenient, cost-effective way, that is Fripp VT. And, and so for whether it's an individual or a company that wants to train salespeople or their executives or just wants it available, it is the best way to learn all aspects of speaking from someone who really knows in a very easy, digestible way. So, for example, anybody listening in or sees the replay, go to Fripp VT as in virtualtraining.com, take a trial, get a free chapter on stories and, and sales and openings. And you see what it's like. It's very interactive. So you really have to learn it. But yeah. that it is great. Yeah. yeah, it is great. And you also have a, your your excellent resource, which is a frip.com as well. And you can find Frip vt through that as well exactly. your website you go to my website on the home page free resources <laughs> events blog, now patricia we are running out of time but there's a few things i still want to cover if okay. you'll just allow me <laughs> um we are absolutely honored and i call patricia my ob1 patricia kenobi the all-knowing so we're honored that she's agreed to um support the psa membership and that's all members across all the regions although it's hosted by psa uh, southeast so patricia this will be on monday the 18th at 7 p.m it's online and we're charging a minimal five pounds plus VAT and all of the funds, all of it goes to the PSA Foundation to support other um, speakers in need. So please tell us more about what members will receive. You will learn how to take what is a good presentation and make it great in five different areas. One, how do you open with impact? Two, how do you make an emotional connection to the audience so they feel, wow, the speaker is talking to me? Three, what is a simple logical structure so you can remember what you're going to say and so can the audience? How do you take your stories and take a good story and make it almost a scene from a made for television movie or perhaps a Hollywood blockbuster? And then five, how do you add a level of specificity that will give you credibility? Fabulous. So much in that time, really. I, I'm really looking forward to it. And I know me, we've actually sold already 50% of, of the tickets and we really haven't started promoting it yet. And, and I must say to people listening, it's for members only of PSA across all of the regions. But you really must go on now and book now because it's a limited availability and 50% has already gone. But I will put a link with this recording as well. So if you allow me, Patricia, I have got some quick fire questions for okay. you. All right. So what's the one thing you have not done yet? Well, you're talking about speaking, of course. No, it's anything. Yeah. I haven't been, but want to go to Mount Rushmore. All oh, right. Brilliant. What are you most passionate about and why? Obviously, the power of the spoken word. Because if an ex-hairstylist who left school at 15 can make a comfortable living and put the words in the mouths of executives, wow, what's your excuse? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've made me think. <laughs> so if you're on a desert island alone, what's the one thing you would take with you? Somebody who's good at building structures that would keep me out the sun, the rain and the cold. A practical person, perhaps a carpenter. And believe me, uh, I'm very good at barking orders. I wouldn't be so good at building a hut. 
I'm sure we're going to get a whole long list of people signing up for that right now, Patricia. So I, I, I'm really grateful for you taking the time out and helping to actually promote the, the next event. Um, there's so much that's going to be covered on the 18th. So anyone that is listening, it's a member of the PSA, whatever region, make sure you just need to put in Patricia Fripp, 18th of June, Eventbrite in any of the search engines and it comes up. It's often a better search than within uh, Eventbrite. So just put in Patricia Fripp, 18th June, Eventbrite, and it will come up. Book your ticket. Lots of them have already gone. So Patricia is going to be talking about how to make your good pres presentation great. So thank you so much for taking the, the time and sharing not only your knowledge, but yourself with us as well. There's so many more questions I wanted to ask you, but you know we're limited by time. Perhaps we'll do this again next year, hey? Well, I'm open. <laughs> Thank Four you so seconds. much. Who says no to you? <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.